Welcome to Section 5 of the Acid-Base Physiology Review. In Section 5, we will go into more detail into metabolic acidosis, including clinical presentation and an introduction to treatment of metabolic acidosis. Welcome to Section 5 of the Acid-Base Physiology Review. In Section 5, we will go into more detail into metabolic acidosis, including clinical presentation as well as a brief introduction to treatment. Remember, metabolic acidosis is a process that leads to a fall in serum bicarbonate concentration. Metabolic acidosis can cause by either a gain of acid, which then is buffered by bicarbonate, decreasing the bicarbonate concentration in blood, or a primary loss of bicarbonate itself. The clinical presentation of metabolic acidosis is varied. It can be as nonspecific as fatigue or abdominal pain, can also be as extreme as arterial dilatation with hypotension and tachycardia. Without measurement of a pH, however, it is not clear simply by clinical features if a metabolic acidosis is present. Therefore, arterial blood gas sampling is necessary anytime you suspect a metabolic or even respiratory acidosis. As we said, a metabolic acidosis can result from either a gain of acid or a loss of bicarbonate. A gain of acid can occur from any of the following. Increase endogenous acid production, ingestion of substances that, whose metabolism leads to increased acid generation, or decreased renal excretion of acid. Remember that in normal physiology, there is some acid production. Both lactate and ketones are present in low concentrations under normal circumstances. However, during physiologic extremes is when the lactic acid concentration or the keto acid concentration becomes clinically re relevant. Alternatively, there can be a loss of bicarbonate. This occurs in the setting of renal losses, primarily with proximal or type 2 renal tubular acidoses, or through gastrointestinal losses through acute diarrhea. The treatment of metabolic acids should be focused on the underlying cause. As we said before, we must always measure the blood pH. Arterial blood gas is the most accurate measure of pH. As pH falls below 7.2 and certainly below 7.1, the cardiovascular effects can be quite severe. Only at these extreme levels should one consider bicarbonate therapy irrespective of the cause of the acidosis. We would never recommend giving bicarbonate without checking the pH, because a low serum bicarbonate concentration may simply reflect a compensation for respiratory alkalosis. In that case, bicarbonate administration could cause a life-threatening alkalemia. Let's go through a few cases. An 18-year-old man presents with two days of fatigue, abdominal pain, and vomiting. Exam shows deep rapid breathing, and tachycardia with a pulse of 120 beats per minute. Initial laboratory tests are as follows. Sodium-136, potassium-4.8, chloride-101, pH-7.26, PCO-2-16, and bicarbonate-10 milligrams per liter. What is his acid-base disorder? Once again, as we outlined in the previous section, let's approach it systematically. First, there is an acidemia. The pH is below the normal range. Next, we look at the serum bicarbonate concentration. It is below the normal range, that there is a primary metabolic acidosis. Next, we calculate the anion gap. Again, this is the difference between the measured sodium and the sum of the measured chloride and bicarbonate. The anion gap, this is 25. As you recall, the normal range of anion gap is between 8 and 12. So this is clearly elevated. Next we look at respiratory compensation. The bicarb is dropped by 15. PCO2 should be dropped by about 20. The PCO2 is slightly lower than what you'd expect, so a mild respiratory alkalosis must also be present. Lastly, we calculate the delta gap. Is the change in bicarbonate concentration equal to the change in anion gap? We said the anion gap was 25. So approximately 13 above the normal range. The bicarb concentration has fallen by approximately 14. These two 
are essentially equal. Therefore, there is only an anion gap acidosis present. This clinical scenario of a young man presenting in this way suggests diabetic ketoacidosis. Clearly, a measurement of serum glucose as well as measurement of serum ketones would confirm this diagnosis. Diabetic ketoacidosis manifests as the follows. A severe high anion gap acidosis can manifest as severe acidemia, hyperglycemia, ketosis with ketones present both in the blood as well as the urine. The osmotic diuresis from the increased glucose concentration causes volume depletion. And finally, an initial measurement of blood, usually there is hyperkalemia despite total body potassium depletion. This is because the insulin deficiency of diabetic ketoacidosis downregulates the activity of the sodium potassium ATPase, which normally keeps the extracellular potassium concentration very low. With decreased sodium potassium ATPase activity, potassium concentration in the blood is allowed to increase. However, because of the osmotic diuresis, as well as the volume depletion and increased aldosterone activity, there is increased potassium losses. So total body potassium depletion is actually present despite the initial high level of blood potassium. The treatment for diabetic ketoacidosis is primarily focused on treatment of the ketosis. Specifically, DKA is a syndrome of insulin deficiency. Therefore, insulin must be given until the gap is closed. Once the glucose reaches close to the normal range, you must also add glucose to any treatment. Volume expansion is necessary as these patients tend to be initially severely volume depleted. Normal saline is the best means of volume expansion. As we said, because of increased potassium losses, total body potassium levels are actually low. However, initially there will be an elevated serum potassium level. Potassium must be replaced, but it is best to wait until the potassium level has reached the normal range before giving additional potassium. In DKA, there's generally not a need for bicarbonate because once insulin is given, the ketones that are present will be converted through the Krebs cycle into bicarbonate. The administration of bicarbonate can often lead to a metabolic alkalosis rather than simply correcting the acidosis. Move to case three. A 48-year-old business executive with alcoholic cirrhosis is admitted to the hospital after six days of abdominal pain and vomiting. Physical exam reveals confusion, asterixis, and ascites. Supine blood pressure is 106 over 78. Upright blood pressure is 104 over 60. Initial lab tests are as follows. Sodium 126, potassium 2.8, chloride 80, pH 7.60, PCO2 34, and bicarbonate 36 milligrams per liter. What is his acid base disorder? First, Look at the pH. Clearly there is alkalemia with a pH much above the normal range. Next, we look at the serum bicarbonate concentration. Bicarbonate concentration is above the normal range, thus a metabolic alkalosis must be present. Next, we look at the PCO2 to see if there's appropriate compensation. The appropriate compensation to metabolic alkalosis should be a fall in minute ventilation and an increase in PCO2. What we see here is the opposite. PCO2 is actually below the normal range. It should be approximately 46, or rather is 34. Thus, the patient has an underlying primary respiratory alkalosis as well as a metabolic alkalosis. Primary respiratory alkalosis is, is common in the setting of decompensated liver disease. This concludes Section 5 of the Acid-Based Physiology Review. The key points to remember from Section 5 are in the approach to a patient with metabolic acidosis to approach it systematically, first starting with measurement of the pH, determination whether the disorder is primarily metabolic or respiratory, calculating an anion gap, checking if there's a secondary concomitant disorder with calculation of the delta gap, and finally whether there is appropriate respiratory compensation.